the call of Christmas. That's our focus for the next few weeks. And we launch this morning by looking at the angelic visit, the angel Gabriel coming to a man named Zechariah. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1 that Zechariah was a priest. We know that he came from the division of Abijah and that his wife was a direct descendant of Aaron, the brother of Moses, the first priest to stand before the ark of the Lord's covenant and make sacrifice, to offer prayers and petition on behalf of God, on behalf of the people. Aaron would seek God, and he would seek God's favor and blessing. So here is Zechariah, who for 50 weeks of the year would stay in his own hometown in the hill country of Judea. And there with his wife Elizabeth, They lived a modest life, a godly life. And surely for decades, they hoped, they wished, and they dreamt that God would bless them with a child. For a child was seen as a sign of God's favor, of His blessing. And though Zechariah and Elizabeth seemed to have committed no sin so grave that God would deny them of this blessing, still, they were without child. Many probably pointed fingers and whispered about this couple growing old, this man who served as a priest. What might he have done wrong that his wife would remain barren her whole life? What sin had she committed? They were disgraced in their own in their own hometown, and yet two weeks a year, his division of priests, the division of Abijah, would go to Jerusalem, and there they would serve at the temple. You see, there were 24 divisions of priests, and each division served for two weeks so that they could be home most of the year to take part in the priestly duties. There were hundreds of priests in Zechariah's division. And so, when the priests came together at the temple, only one could go and burn incense at the altar of the Lord. Only one could stand in God's presence at the Ark of the Covenant. And it would be a great honor. An honor that most priests might experience once in their entire lifetime. It was almost like drawing straws when they cast the lots to determine which one would have this honor. And a man who had been disgraced in his own hometown because he and his wife had grown old without a child. He was chosen. He was selected to go into the presence of God, into the most holy place, morning and evening, and burn incense. He would draw near to God. And God would draw near to him. That's the scene that we find in Luke chapter 1. And I would invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1, where we'll begin to read today at verse 11. As you turn in your Bibles, would you please stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. Luke 1.11 begins, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is as true and relevant for us today as it was 2,000 years ago. When a servant approached your presence and there received the call to prepare. A call of Christmas. Getting ready for a day that would change the world forever. Lord, I believe that today you are still calling your people. Today, Lord God, you are still calling us to prepare because you are doing a great and mighty work. Lord, as we approach this Christmas, may you prepare our hearts and make way for all that you have in store. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, we have the opportunity to enjoy the decorations and the trappings that so many prepared for us. Last Sunday after service, many in our church family took time to hang garland and lights, wreaths, and adorn the trees. Some decorations that have been here for many years and others that are brand new were added to them. And over the coming days, decorations will adorn the exterior of our facility, reminding people what this season is about, the hope and the joy that Jesus brings. I'm excited about what God is doing, and I love this time of year. I don't know about you, but I look forward to all the traditions that come with Christmas time. I look forward to doing the same things that our family has done as we've approached the birth of our Savior. And yet I look forward to something new, because Christmas is about new life, a gift from God. So this Christmas, we looked at a tradition that Anna Yancey and I began when we were first married, to go up toward Apple Hill off Highway 50 the day after Thanksgiving and cut a fresh tree. It's a tradition that in our years living outside of California, we had put on hold, but when we returned to Lodi last year, we picked it up with the kids and they experienced their first real tree at Christmas. It was exciting. You know, in places like Missouri and Colorado, it's hard to find a fresh Christmas tree. They ship them from the, from the West Coast out there. So now that we're back on the West Coast, we go up and cut down our own tree. We had a great time, but, but we made a little tweak, a little change. Things have gotten really busy, and when things get busy, we can easily lose our focus. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes things don't happen just the way they're supposed to, and we can get distracted. And one thing I've learned to do in those moments is to press the pause button. So I spoke with the members of the church board and Stephen, and I said, I need to press pause. Ani Yancey and I looked at our calendar, and the only night that we could get away was Tuesday night, a little earlier than we had planned, but we went up to Placerville and checked into a hotel together as a family and just regrouped and got our focus where it needs to be as we prepare for Christmas. And we decided that instead of going up to Apple Hill the day after Thanksgiving, we'd go up the day before. It seemed like a great idea. Everything was working out flawlessly. Until we drove into that empty lot at Apple Hill. And we saw all those beautiful trees. Some that looked just right for us, but there were no other buyers. Now we figured it's the day before Thanksgiving. We're early. And then we approached the little shed where we would find a cutter and someone to give us a receipt for our purchase, and there was no one. Devastated I was. We had made the drive to Apple Hill, and we would not come back with a tree. Not legally, anyway. And I'm a stickler for following the rules, so we decided to color inside the lines as we walked down the road and looked at the trees that we might want to reconsider when we made 
a trip back to Apple Hill on Friday. Found our tree, got it home, and what joy we had as I went into the backyard and I grabbed the stalk, the trunk of last year's tree to measure the height with. My wife saw me walk out and she said, what are you doing with that thing? That thing that we've kept alongside the fence all year long. That thing that I thought would be a nice piece for a fort for the kids, that thing is the perfect measuring stick. We laid it down alongside our new tree and cut a couple of feet off of the base and a foot or so off of the top and got it to just the right length. And then it took all four of us lifting the tree on our shoulders to get it from the garage, down the walkway, and into our front door. And there we stood it up, cut off all the line that tied it together, and because we have a tall ceiling and we celebrate that fact with a tall tree, we found that if we just slide the tree across the living room beside the stairs, that when I'm standing atop the stairs, I can lift a child to place the angel on top. And so there I was on the ground, grabbing the base of the tree pulling it across the living room, when suddenly I began to feel the weight of the tree shift. I called out loudly, not in human language, but in an unknown tongue, and I could hear the sound of feet on hardwood floors as the tree fell upon me. Do not worry, I have wiped the marks off the walls. The hanging lamp above our heads was not permanently damaged. But things didn't go exactly the way we expected. How many of you know that that happens sometimes at Christmas? Things just don't always go the way we expect. And I would say that was probably the case for Zechariah. His life hadn't gone the way he expected. He believed that if he was a godly, righteous man in the priestly division of Abijah, and he married a woman who was a descendant of Aaron, that together they would raise a family that would bring glory and honor to God. Things didn't go the way he expected. When he got to the city, he probably thought that once again, someone else's name would be drawn from the hat, so to speak. That the lot would fall to another priest. He expected to make sacrifices in the temple court. He expected to stand guard at the gate. But something unexpected happened when his name was drawn. And he was selected to go into the most holy of places. Something unexpected happened when he arrived there and stood in the presence of Almighty God. You see, he received a gift. He received a gift from God. The call of Christmas came to Zechariah there by special delivery. We read in Luke chapter 1, Beginning at verse 18, Zechariah had been approached by an angel and he asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in her years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Gabriel, a messenger from God, approaches the man of God there in the most holy of places, an angelic visit. This isn't the stuff you'd see on the cover of tabloids in the first century. No, this was not unheard of for those who worshipped at the temple, for those who called upon the name of the Lord. And it's not unheard of today. In fact, just this week I went on Google and did a quick search and, and I found more than 21,700,000 results for the words angel encounter in less than one half of one second. You see, 
angel encounters are talked about and written about and told time and time again. And this particular encounter was a very unique and special encounter. Because throughout the pages of Scripture, there are only about a half a dozen angels who are named by name. One of them is Gabriel. The only other angel of God who is named by name is Michael, the archangel. And the other references are all references to fallen angels, Lucifer, Beelzebub, Satan. You see, Gabriel, to be named in the pages of Scripture, is significant. And it's significant that this particular angel would appear to Zechariah in the most holy of places. The name Gabriel, Gavriel in the Hebrew, means warrior of God or man of God. And this name is only found in four places in the Bible. Two are in the book of Daniel. The first we see in Daniel chapter 8, beginning at verse 15, when Daniel the prophet, who would tell of the end times, said, while I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from Ulai calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. Ulai was, was the canal that ran outside of the citadel at Susa, where Daniel the prophet saw a vision of the Lord. Some of the prophecies that Daniel describes have begun to unfold. Others we are still awaiting to see fulfilled. The second reference to the name of the angel Gabriel appears in the very next chapter of the book of Daniel, in chapter 9, verse 21 and 22, we read, While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. How interesting it is that at the time of the sacrifice, the angel Gabriel came and spoke. It was at the time when Zechariah would offer a sacrifice of incense in the holiest of places, when the angel Gabriel would come and speak to him. That's the third reference in Scripture, and the fourth is found later in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Every time Gabriel appeared, something special was taking place. God was foretelling of his deliverance through Jesus. He was foretelling of the one who would go before Jesus, John the Baptist. And he foretold the birth of Jesus to his earthly mother, to Mary, the one who was chosen. There's just something powerful about the call of Christmas. It's not ordinary, it's extraordinary. And yet, angels are everywhere. Many of us think that we have a guardian angel, but I believe God's Word paints a different picture. In Psalm 91, beginning at verse 9, we read, If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. I don't believe that any one of us has a single guardian angel, but rather that God has an entire army of angels at His command that He can dispatch at any moment, a squadron or battalion of angels who can come to your defense, come to your aid, and fight off the spiritual forces of evil that threaten to kill, steal, and destroy. You see, there are angels everywhere, and the Word of God tells us that there is war being made in the heavenlies. 
and we can't even see it. But the angels are all around us. Some of them we can see, but we may not recognize. They don't always take flight as Gabriel did when he approached Daniel in Daniel 9. But in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, we're told, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. We may encounter angels unaware. Unaware that the one before us is a messenger from God sent at that precise moment for a reason that is beyond our understanding. And yet here was Zechariah the priest. In the most holy of places where no one else was allowed to tread. And the angel came to him. And called him to prepare. To prepare for a tremendous gift that was beyond his own ability. Beyond his comprehension. And even beyond his belief. Zechariah was called to quiet preparation. We read in Luke 1.20 that the angel said, And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Can I tell you, I don't think that Zechariah's silence was just a punishment. I don't think it was some passive-aggressive trick that Gabriel the angel was holding up his sleeve to throw out on Zechariah in that moment because of his disbelief. But rather, Zechariah's silence may have been as much a gift as it was a consequence of his disbelief. Much like those who are deaf may be able to focus without the distraction of sound, Zechariah was able to focus without the sound of his own voice. For those who have been coming out on Tuesday nights and enjoying Mike and Vicky's class in sign language, you may have already begun to recognize that communication is more than just verbal and sometimes all the noise gets in the way. Nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication transcends language. There are gestures, expressions that can communicate more than a word. Maybe Zechariah was really good at charades. Because when he came out, we read in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 21, meanwhile the people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. He made signs to them. Though it's unthinkable that at that time he would have gotten to enjoy a class in sign language, in a culture where a formalized sign language didn't even exist. He somehow communicated with gestures that he saw an angel in the sky. It appeared before him, perhaps in a blinding light. It spoke to his heart. And now he couldn't speak. And though those gestures may not have fit into a norm of, of American sign language, people began to understand because this man had been in the most holy of places. See, nonverbal communication can transcend so many of the barriers that our language and our culture, that our generations can put up and divide us from one another. There's just something about Approaching someone who is hurting, who is cold, who is lonely, and extending a hand. The gesture of a hand on a shoulder or a clasped hand on theirs. An arm around someone in need 
or wrapping a blanket around them communicates more than words can. It's often said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Zechariah must become very good at painting pictures with his hands and his face. Who knows, maybe he grabbed a doodle pad and began to draw But Scripture says that he kept making signs. He communicated the wondrous thing that God had done for him without words. What signs do people see in your life and mine that we have had an encounter with Almighty God? Do they see the difference in the way that we behave in the way that we live? What signs do they experience as they drive down our street? In a few days, there will be signs that will say hope and joy that carry a silhouette of the nativity, speaking a message to everyone in our community that it's through Jesus that we have lasting hope. And it's only by the gift of Jesus that we can experience joy to the fullest. And as Zechariah returned home in silence to prepare for the coming of the baby that he now knew was on his way. Oh, he knew it because the angel gave him a sign in his silence. If that angel could take his voice away, then he could keep this promise too. He returned home and there he found his wife Elizabeth and somehow managed to share the good news with her of what God was doing. But she felt a stirring in her body. She received a special call, a special blessing. And life began to grow within her womb. And we read in Luke chapter 1 beginning at verse 23 about the private preparation. When his time of service was completed... He returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. She knew with every kick, with every movement, with every turn, that God was doing something so great that all the shame, all the hurt, all the heartache that she had carried for decades would pass away as they welcomed the life of a child whose name meant joy, laughter. You see, this child, John, would brighten their home, brighten their hearts, and shine a light to the one who is the light of the world. That many would come to know him. In this private preparation, Elizabeth, Zechariah, got everything ready for the celebration that was ahead. Because they knew something great was coming. It's amazing for me as a father to watch my children prepare for Christmas as they grow. Aniansi was just saying yesterday how it used to be like magic for them when they would awake one morning and they would see a Christmas tree all lit up and decorated, stockings hung, wreath on the door, little figures and plush toys set out. Christmas was coming. They were little and weren't ready to hold the ornaments. They weren't ready to string the lights. They weren't patient enough to go through the process. But now our kids are excited to be a part of it. They're excited to be lifted up to place the angel on top. Excited to hang the ornaments. And they're excited to dig through the boxes marked Christmas until they find inside Little boxes with the trees for their rooms. It was interesting yesterday as Aniansi and I took a nap. Abigail was working on an assignment for school and Zachary couldn't contain the excitement. He wanted to put 
his little tree in his room. And he knew that if he could get his sister to do the same, then it would be okay with mom and dad. But she wasn't ready. She told her brother, I need to finish this, and then I need to clean my room. And as Abigail did her schoolwork, Zachary did something that I'm not sure if he's ever done it before. Sometimes unexpected things occur. My son entered his sister's room alone. And there he began to fold and put away her clothes. He put all of her dolls in the right places. And he laid out the blankets on her bed. And when she finished her homework and came upstairs, he said, everything is ready. Now, let's do the Christmas trees. That act of quiet preparation not only touched his sister's heart, but touched ours as well. What could God do through those moments when we think no one's looking as we prepare for something greater that God has in store? Well, I would say that much as Zechariah received the call of Christmas, a call to prepare, God is calling you and me to prepare for something great. As we approach this Christmas morning together, I would invite you to answer God's call to prepare very intentionally. First of all, I would encourage you to get alone with God. The call to prepare requires us to get alone with God, to hear what He has to say by listening to His voice. And as we listen to his voice, to allow the truth of his word to guide our actions and let our actions speak to those around us. And finally, to answer the call to prepare, I would encourage you to expect new life. To expect new life to be breathed into you this Christmas season. To get ready for all that God desires to do in you and through you. To expect new life to be breathed into your family this Christmas season. To heal old rifts and to restore fractured relationships. To be the God of peace who mends and heals. To expect new life to be breathed into those who are far from God. You see, we're not the Holy Spirit. We don't save souls. And yet somehow, the Spirit of God breathes through us to encourage, to invite, and to elevate the attitudes, the hearts, and the minds of those who need Him most. I believe that this Christmas will be marked with new life as we answer God's call to prepare. And it begins with you and with me. You see, God is calling each and every one of us, much like He called Ezekiel. Much like he called Zechariah. Much like he called Daniel and Elizabeth and David. I believe he's calling out to you to draw near to him. So I want to encourage you in this moment to do exactly that. To draw near to God. Get alone with God. Listen to his voice. Let your actions speak and expect new life.